how much can we reduce human influences and will that make a difference for the climate? Because there are other ways of adapting to a changing climate. When, when you look at the, the first issue, which is how much could you really reduce human influences, you're facing the drivers of demographics, namely the global population is increasing and it's increasing more in the developing world, and you're facing the other driver of development. 40% of the people right now on the planet, that's 3 billion people, don't have adequate energy. And the best way, the fastest way of getting them that energy is through fossil fuels. And so we're going to see emissions growing from the developing world, even if we in the developed world can reduce our emissions. The less wealthy countries clearly will find it more difficult to adapt. I think the best thing that we in the developing world can do is to help them move along the economic development path and strengthen their societal institutions so that they'll be able to, for example, execute national strategy plans better than they can at the moment. Climate modelers make their best effort at tackling what is an extraordinarily difficult challenge. Different people make different assumptions, and so we have 50 different models that disagree with one another and disagree with the observations on scales that matter for human influences on the climate. The models are useful, they're interesting, but to be able to make societal decisions on that basis is really very difficult and is taking a lot of risk. How fast should we respond to the risks that growing greenhouse gas concentrations pose? You have to take a balance between two competing factors. If we decarbonize too rapidly, then we induce all sorts of turmoil in the economy and incur costs that way. If we decarbonize too slowly, then the climate risks might grow unreasonably large. And when you work out the balance, as many people have tried to do and continue to do, what you discover is that we should proceed far more slowly than is being advocated in, for example, the Paris Accord. And we should optimally let the global temperature rise to something like three degrees, which is much, that's twice as much as Paris is talking about. Develop the technologies, do it slowly, and then come down more strongly as the technology allows us to do. And what is interesting is when you do that, even for a three or four degree rise, the impact on the economy at let's say 2100, either globally or nationally for the US, is only a few percent. So if the economy is growing at 2% a year, you might be behind in your growth by one or two years in 2100. So it's minimal. And again, this is not Steve talking or Steve's interpretation of the literature and the reports, but is in fact what's written in them. The energy systems of the world change slowly. They change slowly because they need to be reliable. They change slowly because a lot of the components that make up the energy system, like generators or transmission lines, last a long time. And you don't want to destroy them before their time, so to speak. And so we need to be changing the energy system by slow, steady pressure rather than by drastic measures. I like to say by orthodonture rather than tooth extraction. And what's being proposed now by the US government, I expect the Canadian government and other countries in the developed world, is something like a full mouth job. Uh, so let us take it thoughtfully, slowly, do it well, and not risk unreliability in our energy supplies, increasing dependence on imported oil for the US, the premature destruction of assets, uh, and all of those economic disruptions that will happen if we do decarbonization too rapidly. Certainly the climate and the changes in the climate will have a large regional variability. Some places it will get warmer, other places it will get colder, drier, wetter, 
and so on. And you can look at the IPCC maps that have just been put out with the latest report and see the variation across, across regions. Uh, for example, for hurricanes, there is no global trend in hurricanes. The report says that in the number of the frequency, there is some indication that the strongest hurricanes are becoming more frequent over the last 30 or 40 years. But the research papers say, well, maybe the data is just for too short a period. Most of the working level climate scientists I know go about their job with the usual caveats, care that uh, you see in all good fields of science. And I'm not disagreeing with anything that's said in the literature or even anything that's said in the reports. All I'm doing is making evident to non-experts what's actually in the reports. If you look at the book, Unsettled, you'll see that every statement I make is referenced either to the IPCC reports, the US government reports, the primary research literature, or the underlying data itself. So I'm not denying anything. What I'm denying is how we talk about the data and the science. 